And I, I mean, there's no way. <laughs> I'm, just not, I'm, not, I'm not even going to pretend. All right, so we are <clears throat> getting close to the end. Tonight is the last night that I'll try to put out any new information, new material. Next week is the last week of the quarter. We'll reserve that for uh, a summary and some last-minute thoughts to tie it all together. I want to leave some time next week for open discussion. You can bring anything to the table that you want as things may have caught your attention throughout our study this quarter. So we'll, uh, we'll reserve next week for those purposes. Uh, tonight will be, um, it's a wrap up. And if you think about last week and the week before, they've been somewhat independent studies. Um, two weeks ago, we looked at pagan religions of this geographic area where the Israelites went into. Uh, last week, we looked at uh, all very, very high level. The Egyptians, a little bit of information about their culture, and I, I got actually quite a bit of feedback. Apparently, all of you are Egyptologists, or at least you want to be. Uh, so that's good. And then tonight, I thought we would do the other bookend to that, right? Egypt being one bookend where the, the Hebrews came out of Egypt you know, with the Exodus. God drew them out by his mighty hand. <clears throat> And then tonight, the original intent was to take a high-level look at Babylon, which would represent the other end of that time frame for, for Israel as they went into exile in Babylon. That was the intent. When I got into the study, I, this, the, the material actually kind of threw me a curveball. So I got into the study and realized that while I intended on talking about Babylon, it's really hard to separate Babylon from Mesopotamia generally, right? So I, I, I retrenched a little bit, and I'm going to try to cover seven and a half pages of notes <laughs> covering Mesopotamia. There's no way we'll get to it, but I'll hit some high points. Here, here's the deal. Babylon represents the what from our perspective would be the most recent, so the most current in history of that Mesopotamian region. But prior to that, you had Sumer, which I've mentioned before, is largely considered the first civilization, the, the first grouping of people, the first population that checked most of the boxes that would be checked in order to be considered it a civilization. So it really starts with Sumer, which was in the southern portion geographically, of Mesopotamia. Um, let's get the slides up. You've seen these before. Um, Mesopotamia would, well, wait a minute. Mesopotamia would be in this area here between the Euphrates and the Tigris River. And actually, the, the word means between the rivers. So. <clears throat> That's Mesopotamia generally. And I use this map, I know we've seen it before, but I use this map because of this green shaded section which I added to represent that, that fertile crescent, right? It's that whole area largely between the rivers and then falling down through Canaan and into Egypt along the Nile River and the Nile River Valley and Delta region. That whole area was just perfect for growing food. And so, because that's where the water was, that's where the food was, that's where the people landed. If you impose that on a modern-day map, this region of Mesopotamia really falls mostly in Iraq, cuts through Syria, and then catches a little bit of uh, southern Turkey. Um, so that, if you have a mental picture of the modern-day geography, this is more or less what it looks like. Don't take the shaded sections too literally. It's really just intended to give you a little bit of an idea. So Sumer, which is where I want to start tonight. Sumer, as a civilization, really took hold in southern Mesopotamia. And then Assyria, the orange section in the north, Babylon, the blue section in the south. Those two empires eventually came after Sumer. And, and conti but continue geographically in that same area. Let me just get it out right up front. Right? The reason it's so hard to separate one from another, Sumer, uh, 
and then there's a, a 200 year empire in the middle called uh, Akkadia or Akkad, 200 years there, and then the Assyrians and then the Babylonians generally is how the power structure flowed. The problem is all of these empires originally started as cities or city states. And if you go back and try to digest the history of this whole region, it's just one giant war. You know, somebody's going to fight somebody, who's going to fight somebody, then they're going to fight the original two. I mean, they're just trading punches all constantly for thousands of years. They're just trading punches. And so all of these areas really existed all along, uh, but it was different points in time where they came, came to, um, to power. So we'll dig into that a little bit. Before we get started, let's go to, go to God in prayer and ask his blessings on our study, and then we'll dig in. Our God and our Father in heaven, we are thankful for the privilege of being here tonight, learning and sharing information coming from your word, learning from each other, learning from your word. And Father, we ask that you always open our minds and open our hearts to the truth of your message. We also ask, Father, that you strengthen our hands so that we have opportunity to serve and glorify you, that we are made aware, and that we are prompted to do so. Thank you for your love and help us to love each other. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Starting with Sumer. More or less 5,000 B.C., give or take. Again, these areas existed all along, but at 5,000 B.C., that would kind of predate the Egyptians, actually. Um, Sumer came into its own more around the 3000 BC period, which if you remember last week's lesson was about the same time Egypt really came into its own when, when the Pharaoh Narmer unified all of these independent areas within Egypt under, under a single Egyptian banner. <clears throat> but Sumer as a civilization coalesced around 5000 BC, like we saw on the map, primarily in southern Mesopotamia and continued as a civilization until uh, they were unified with Akkad, a, a king named Sargon of Akkad, um, unified his territory in the north of Mesopotamia and Sumer, which has existed in the south. Now, <clears throat> there's a lot that's out there about Sumer in terms of how they were the first civilization and how they developed as a civilization. I mean, all of these areas like I said before, they, they were intent on, on constantly fighting each other, right? It's one constant war after another. But some did focus on building civilizations and what, what I would say, you know, more mankind-friendly endeavors um, than others. The Assyrians were just brutes, right? And we'll get to them in just a minute. So we have Sumer. They, they continued from about 5,000 B.C. down to about 2334 when the Sumerian civilization was um, unified with Akkad and continued as the Akkadian I I Empire beginning about 2334 down to about 2154. Just less than 200 years. So it didn't last long. The, the contribution that the Akkadians made is that while Sumer was the first practical civilization, the Akkadian were the first practical empire in that they united Sumer and Akkad. Both of these groups spoke different languages, and Sargon of Akkad was the first one to have united what were previously completely different groups of people. Didn't last long. They found that, that administratively it was just too difficult to maintain that unification. So um, Sumer went through, they came in and out at different periods where they were a little more independent, a little less independent, had more influence at different points of time, a little less influence at different points in time, and sort of continued that way until about the year 2025, that's B.C., um, when the Assyrians really rose to power. Now, Assyria rose out of the city-state Asher, A-S-S-U-R, Asher, and, and that city-state had existed for a long, long time. But it was about 2025 that that city-state, through conquest, gained enough power to, to start to expand and, and take over the entire region, actually getting as far uh, west as Egypt right, in, in terms of building their empire. 
And, and, and by the time of around 1363, so this is, you know, 700 years, give or take, between when we would mark a point in time of, of Assyria really starting as a, as, a, as a unified culture, as a unified civilization. It was about 700 years that, that they overtook until they finally gained power across the entire region. Um, put this back on. This map is as good as any. So Assyria, I've got it drawn here. That was the hub. But at their height of power, Assyria really would have covered this entire area. I mean, down here is nothing but desert. There's nothing really of value there. But Assyria's in, empire would have really covered this entire area, e including parts of Egypt. So like I say, they were, they were brutes. They really didn't have much to contribute in the way of um, you know, enhancing mankind's situation, uh, but they were really good at military activity. They were really good at bringing people in under the rule of the Assyrian kings. What's interesting is that there are several Assyrian kings mentioned in the Bible. So first king, or, or second kings, for example, I'll try to touch on those later. But some of those kings are mentioned in the Bible, which is, which is useful because we know from extra biblical records when those kings reigned, and that allows us then to put a timestamp on the biblical text. So I, I find that very interesting. And actually, to be honest with you, things like that strengthen my faith because, you know, as you know, it's been part of my, my intent for the entire study for us to start thinking of the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, because it seems so far removed from us. But thinking of the Old Testament not as stories, but as events, right? And, and when you think of it as events, then to me at least, the, the impact changes because it's, it's, like I say, it's not just stories, right? It's, it's real people doing real things in their real lives. And, and then the Bible is how God used that for his purpose. So if there's nothing else that I hope you take from the entire quarter, that, that would be one of the, the, the headline takeaways that, that, that I hope is meaningful to you, right? It's real. It's real. And these kings occupied a real place in history, and we can put a timestamp on that outside of biblical text and within the biblical text. So um, that's the Assyrians. Interestingly, the Assyrians finally fell uh, because they couldn't control the Babylonian problem, which uh, is a way of saying Assyria tried to overtake Babylon at one point. It was, was pretty successful. Babylon then sort of broke away. Um, <clears throat> midway through Assyria's reign, and then uh, along about 18, well, it was, late, it was earlier than that. So by the time of Daniel, let's say, you're putting a time stamp there of 700 B.C., 5, 5 6, 700 B.C., that time range. So by the time of Daniel, and we read of Nebuchadnezzar, for example, that is Syria's, or I'm, not, I'm sorry, that is Babylon's second go-around at being the, the, the world dominating power in the area, right? So Babylon, you really have to think in terms of two primary points in time where they were the primary world power. And again, to make the point, all of these areas sort of came and went. All of these empires, all of these civilizations came and went at different points in time. They might be relatively more powerful at some points in time, relatively less power at some points in time, but they, they sort of all existed all along, if nothing else, as cities or city-states. <clears throat> it's just who was able to bring the military might together, bring the resources together to ultimately sort of take over as a, as a, as a unifying power at any given point in time. <clears throat> but all along, thousands of years, I mean, these guys are just duking it out. It's just one punch after another to see who, who would be the last man standing after round one, after round two, after round three, if you want to approach it as a, as a boxing match. I hope that analogy helps, but that's, that's how I read it. So that's 5,000 years in 10 minutes and a whole lot of Advance. Let's talk about Sumer just a little bit. <clears throat> and the reason I want to start with Sumer is all of these civilizations, 
They were all about war. They were all about gaining ground. They were all about taking over. They were all about being in power within the area. But the Sumerians, not some area, but Sumeria, the Sumerians, did at least demonstrate a, a, an intent to build a civilized society. So what, what do I mean by that? <clears throat> First of all, the origin of Sum the Sumerians is not really known. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Um, but they referred to themselves as the black-headed people, uh, and, and we'll put, place a starting point of about 5,000 B.C. They were the first to be considered a true civilization, meaning there's a large population centers consisting of large urban areas. They engaged in building monuments, so their architecture was more than just utilitarian. It was monument-based. As you can imagine, a lot of this was... was you know, it, driven by the religious practice of the time and the worship of all the pagan gods that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. But nonetheless, they had a monument architecture system and there were unique art styles. There were shared communication strategies. In other words, specific rules that everyone generally followed for written language, for spoken language, alphabets, numeric systems. They had shared communication strategies that allowed them not only to build their own society, build their civilization, but it also facilitated their effectiveness as, as a trading partner, which, which you know, is kind of obvious there, right? That's, that's important. Um, there was an emphasis on creating the infrastructure to support the, the, the development of trade and technology. Um, there was a, a, a system of cultural exchange, the exchange of, of ideas. Uh, there were systems of government and legal systems that were recognized and formalized. Uh, there were systems of governing the, the widespreading territories. So you may have you know, the king and then governors that get appointed over certain areas and then lower level officials and then still lower level officials. All of this power structure then you know, sort of formed wide at the base and rolled up. To the, to the king himself. Um, there was a division of labor, and then there were recognized social and economic classes. Um, slavery was common uh, across all of these civilizations, including Sumer. Um, most, civil, most of these societies recognized at least two groups of people, one free, one slave. But they may have different words for different types of slavery. So for example, um, where the Israelites would have been overtaken people, exiled, moved to either Assyria or, or Babylon. I mean, they were slaves as we would think of slaves, right? They, they, they had no rights. They had no, they, they just did what they were told and, and, and worked. Um, but then you would have slaves where someone may be in debt and they would enslave themselves or put themselves in servitude to the debtor until that debt was paid off. They still may maintain some rights as a citizen, but those rights would have been limited by their choice, right? That would be a different flavor of, of a slave. <clears throat> Going back to that fertile crescent, the reason Sumer established itself so well is that they were able to grow food really, really well. And they got really, really good at it because they got really, really good at the, the art of irrigation. Right? They're sitting between two rivers, that's good. So you've got the water there, but how do you get the water from where it is to where you want it so that you can grow the crops that you need? One reason why they were able to establish themselves as a civilization is that they had gotten so good at the agricultural aspect that they had an abundance of food. They had more food than what they needed. And that freed them up for other pursuits, whether that was roads and architecture or artistic pursuits or whatever. In other words, you didn't need everyone out in the field growing the food just to survive as, as a society. Now, <clears throat> Sumer, Sumer, over time, sorry to say soon, that's not the right word. Over time, Sumer, where the water was a blessing, and where their skill at irrigation was a blessing, over time that became a curse. Because they got so good at moving water, they would flood these fields, the, 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 the silt soil would settle, those fields would become very fertile, they had the water, they could grow the crops. But because of the um, 
uh, climate, that water would evaporate quickly. And so over time, the level of salt in the soil increased to the point where wheat was no longer a, a, a viable crop and they switched to barley. So they kind of muddled their way through it, but they, they knew what was happening. And actually, the records that I'm reading suggest that they knew it was the salt in the soil that was causing the problem. But it had gone on for so long, there was really no way to reverse course, right? Because the water sources remain the same, the Tigris and Euphrates River. So this salt buildup over time, plus a period of climate change where the, 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 there was some drought uh, later in the Sumerian history, really those are the two factors that brought Sumer more or less to a point where they we, were weak enough where uh, Akkad, Sargon of Akkad could, could take over. Right? The Sumerians had just lost their ability to grow enough food to, to remain viable. So um, they were overtaken, ultimately, uh, like we talked about a few minutes ago. Um, to, put, to put it in perspective, by 1700 BC, it's estimated that the population of the traditional Sumer area, which would be southern Mesopotamia, had decreased by 60%. So think of the United States, 50 or 60 percent of the people just moving away or dying. Right? That, that, that's a big blow to, to society. Um, all of these societies were male dominated. However, this is interesting, women had actually substantial rights in, in a lot of these areas early on. The rights of women actually decreased over time. A lot of these kingdoms, empires, did see women uh, leaders, some, some even you know, empress, I guess would be the right word, uh, at, at different times. There weren't many, but, but it did happen. But women, especially, like I say, early on, the women could own land, women could inherit, the women could sell land, the women could um, you know, participate in, in bequeathing that land to, to their heirs. So women uh, actually held uh, quite a few legal rights early on in these civilizations that, like I say, declined over time. Um, Sumerian writing is one of, the, one of their really high points in terms of their, their, the development of their Civilization, it makes sense. It goes back to that formal systems of communication. Um, but the writing was, was, it was very broad. So it was historical records, legal documents, records for trade, including receipts. Like you go to Walmart, you get a receipt. I mean, some of these were as mundane as a receipt for, for goods purchased. Uh, personal letters, business letters, as you would expect, religious-based writings, and then works of fiction, which caught my attention a little bit. And I think that goes back to their, you know, how skilled they became at growing food. Because if you've got an abundance of food, then you are free to pursue other things, artistic endeavors, or fictional writing. I mean, you don't, you don't, you don't sit down and write fiction if you're starving to death. So I, I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, <clears throat> These written documents were written on clay tablets, so an, uh, uh, an extensive library would actually be hard to manage. They did, but, but they were written on clay tablets. And so when the clay was moist, they would take a, 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 a stick or a reed or, or perhaps a piece of metal, had a, a kind of an angled shape to the end, and they would press that into the, the moist clay to create the document. The clay would dry and then the document became permanent. Um, the, the writing itself was called cuneiform, and it was an evolution out of what began as Sumerian hieroglyphics, basically, is what we, we would think more, so more of an iconic written language structure. But cuneiform was the, the written language that they, they used for hundreds, thousands of years. Cuneiform continued on into, you know, through these other civilizations into Babylon. Um, they were accomplished artists, uh, very skilled metalworking, 
uh, and that would include gold, silver, copper, bronze. They were skilled at inlaying semi-precious and precious stones into this metalworking art. So they were, they were very skilled at what they did. From an architecture standpoint, um, everything in the area is mud brick. I mean, there's just no trees there to, 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 for wood. And what's there would be used very, very limited cases. So most of it was mud brick. Maybe there was an occasional use of limestone where um, there, was a, there was a risk of water deteriorating the mud brick, which um, would happen. But anything other than mud was very limited a as a resource. Um, some of the trade, most of the trade actually was to obtain some of these materials that they would use primarily for building. So for example, they may trade with Lebanon, which to put it on the map up here in this area. So the trade would extend that far. What do we know about Lebanon? Cedars of Lebanon, right? So Lebanon had provided the wood. Um, and so that wood may then be used for structural purposes. For example, the joists for a second story in, in a building, for example, where mud brick just simply wouldn't suffice. Um, <clears throat> They were skilled at cutting, and where they did have stone, they were very skilled at using that stone, but it just wasn't very available. They did have a system of arches that they included in their, in their architecture. So uh, you know, I take that to, to, that they clearly understood the concept of geometry. They understood the concept of distribution of weight as they would use the arch structure to, to make buildings that would stand the test of time. All right, religion. This is interesting, and this applies to every one of these empires or civilizations. They all had their gods, and, and, and one of God's primary beefs with them, with all of them, was their idolatrous worship. So they all had their gods. And, and like we talked about two weeks ago, these gods most often represented, where well, they were represented in human form, so they were kind of represented in, in the people's likeness, which is important, number one. Important number two is that the gods were tied to natural phenomena. So we have a god, a god of the river, a god of the rain, a god of the sun, a god of the moon, a god of the stars. Much later on, you may have gods that were uh, tied to concepts, such as a god of love, a god of warfare, all of them had gods of warfare, believe me. <laughs> they, they really relied on their gods of warfare. But so they all had these pagan gods, looked like them, but were gods to natural phenomenon that they couldn't control. So by having this pantheon of gods, all of these civilizations are, are admitting that their, their survival is chiefly outside their hands. They cannot do anything, for example, to, to affect the weather. So in that sense, they had a very humble outlook toward life. They realized their, their shortcomings. Now, the second um, offense that God claimed against all of these societies, especially Assyria and Babylon, is their pride. And, and actually, I think the word arrogance is better. And, and we read in 2 Kings, or we read in Daniel, for example, where, where 2 Kings, the Assyrian king was saying, What's wrong? I'm, I'm obviously I'm paraphrasing, but he's saying, what's wrong? Is your God going to save you? Has your God never heard what my armies can do? Went to bed, woke up, 180,000 of his soldiers, dead. The king went home, <laughs> decided not to engage in battle, right? So God, they, while they were very humble in realizing their, their inability to really affect their own survival. They were also off the charts. I mean, the, the meter is pegged in terms of their arrogance. That's the point of 
the, 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 the story the, in Genesis with the, the Tower of Babel that we grew up hearing about in, in Bible school as kids. That's the point. God is recognizing their arrogance and confuses the language as a way of mitigating that to some degree. But that arrogance continues on and on and on, and it's consistent through all of these. Now, maybe the Assyrians brought that to, you know, to its height because like the Assyrians were just, they were brutes. They, I don't read where they contributed much to the advancement of civilization. Uh, they were just all about overtaking somebody, their neighbor. And it was driven by arrogance. Nebuchadnezzar, he became a, a beast in the field. Why? Because of his arrogance. And Nebuchadnezzar seems to have come around a little bit. Nebuchadnezzar's son, this is in Daniel, where he sees the, 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 the writing on the wall. Daniel comes in to interpret that. And basically Daniel says, because of your arrogance, your life will be required. That night, God took his life because of his arrogance. So I find that to be, you know, an interesting juxtaposition of, of their mentality. And if you want to put that in terms of a cultural discussion, right, that does say a lot about who they were and, and, and what motivated them and how they thought about things. I, I can't reconcile the humility toward their own existence, you know, being able to, to, to really affect their own survival. I can't reconcile that with their arrogance elsewhere. But, but based on my study, that's the two extremes. And that's, the, that's the, the mentality of this entire part of the world for thousands of years. I think that explains why we see the constant warfare. It explains why God was so displeased with them because that arrogance led to so many different sins. The, the, the idolatry, I would argue, is actually an outcome of that arrogance. The, their gods were made in their image. Right? Let's move on. Uh, Sumer, you, you got to mention the, 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 the chief techno technological ad advancement, which is the wheel. <laughs> so you got to mention that, but they, they, were, they, were, they were smart people. Uh, okay, Akkadian. The Akkadian Empire only lasted about 300 years. I won't, I'm sorry, about 180 years. Um, established roughly 2334 B.C. when Sargon of Akkad uh, united the Akkadian-speaking people and the Sumerian-speaking peoples into a unified political structure. They couldn't hold on, uh, so it eventually disintegrated, and that's about all we'll, we'll say to that. All of these societies that follow Sumer, all these, these, these uh, civilizations that follow Sumer, right? everything that the Sumerians had developed, everything they had learned, really passed from one to the other. So these, these societies that followed built on what they inherited from Sumer. Um, so that's why I spent so much time with, with Sumer. Okay, Assyria. So they were a city-state. They came, came to power a little bit, a couple of times. And then uh, in, in 1363, they finally achieved their independence. And we've talked a little bit about how their power ultimately covered such a large territory. Again, it was this whole area here, even down through Egypt. I mean, they, they were just huge. They were really good at military campaigns. And they were pretty good at keeping that, th those people stitched together. It's not that anybody really liked the Assyrians, but they were pretty good at keeping them stitched together once they, once they overthrew these different um, peoples, the different city-states and what have you. There are several Assyrian kings mentioned in the Bible. Um, Shalmaneser, that's a tough one, uh, ruled 727 to 722. 
I mention him because it was during his reign that the northern kingdom of Israel was taken to a captivity into Assyria. Right? Um, Isaiah 20, we, we see where Sargon is, is, is mentioned. Um, Sargon, which, not mentioned for good reasons, he, was witness, he, he witnessed the fury of the Lord after defying God and an angel struck him down. I mean, that's, what an epithet. To, <laughs> you know, it's, what, a, what a thing to be remembered for. But, um, and then that's when the Lord struck down 185 Assyrian soldiers. Um, <clears throat> so Assyria's official downfall is historically put at 609 B.C. Um, but you got to understand, you know, again, it's not so much they were completely, none of these were ever completely overtaken. They all sort of continued, maybe in a less powerful state. But Assyria continued on into what we would think of in the New Testament times. Right? They existed for a long, long time. The primary god was Asher, A-S-H-U-R. <clears throat> the Assyrian kings didn't necessarily see themselves as gods, but they did see themselves as an intermediary between Asher and mankind. So they certainly elevated their position within society. And they saw, particularly Assyria, they saw it as their duty to and, and, and use the God as a way of, and their intermediary status as a way of justifying their imperial expansion. Right? And, and we've seen this throughout history. <clears throat> um, I think this phrase sums it up. They saw it as divinely sanctioned to convert chaos into civilization. That was their purpose. And they felt that their primary gods sanctioned them to engage in this warfare, taking over the other lands, um, converting chaos to civilization. Uh, as you can imagine, their military was, was one of the largest in world history, uh, very powerful, uh, continued, they, they, they continued the evolution of the use of chariots in warfare. They actually developed the use of cavalry, so horse-based military campaigns, uh, and the adoption of iron for armor and weapons. So this is the transition between the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. Right? So they, they adopted the use of iron for uh, both weapons and armor, and then they became very good at conducting siege warfare. In other words, they would just kind of camp out a, you know, around a city until the city just surrendered. And they were very good at that, um, to the point where they would divert rivers, for example, and, and cut off the water flow. They were very good at this concept of siege warfare. As I said earlier, women largely held the same rights as men in Assyria, at least early on, uh, but the status of women did decline over time, um, at, at least according to official law. Now, the reason I say it in those ways, not all of these laws were enforced all of the time, and um, based on my studies, it seems like that, that women, especially women within the upper classes, um, they, were, you know, they were still able to independently hold wealth, independently buy and sell land, independently give an inheritance, independently receive an inheritance, all those kinds of um, activities. Uh, Assyria, especially early on, traded extensively. Like Sumer, the buildings were always made of mud brick, pretty much just like Sumer uh, in, in that regard. Um, very little artwork come out of, coming out of Assyria. Uh, and what was there? was often either related to government seals, so an official seal on a document, or artwork that honored the king, or artwork that some, served some religious purpose. So not a whole lot there in terms of artwork. All right, so now we'll get to Babylon. <clears throat> Both Assyria and Babylon grew out of Sumer and Akkad, the earlier civilizations. Babylon had always been a small city. Uh, it's just that the, the, the time was right for Babylon to gain uh, ground from a political and from an influence uh, point of view with, within the geographic area. You probably know of Babylon based on 
uh, one of their earlier kings, King Hammurabi. Hammurabi. <clears throat> and what King Hammurabi brought to the world stage is a codified legal system. It's not that that, you know, obviously legal systems had existed before, but he, 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 went, he took it to the extra step and, and formalized that based on case study and, and, and brought that code to, to, to use in, in a formal sort of way. It was one of the first uh, legal codes that was built on the theory of innocent until proven guilty. So, um, you know, that, that's really his largest claim to fame. All right, uh, we'll skip down Nebuchadnezzar. And again, this would be Nebuchadnezzar the second. Right, this is where we would pick up in, in the book of Daniel, for example. He ruled from 605 to 562 B.C. Um, Nebuchadnezzar is really the, the king that brought Babylon to its height of, of glory. And, and that would be a, a complete reconstruction of the imperial grounds, uh, the ziggurats or the, you know, the pyramid-shaped, step pyramid-shaped buildings that you've probably seen pictures of. There's a particular gate called the Ishtar Gate, look that up. It's a magnificent structure that um, he is credited with overseeing its, its construction. Um, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, I throw that in. I won't, camp, I won't camp on it, but I'll throw it in. I'm sure you've heard of it. The problem is there's actually some debate whether they ever existed or whether it was really Babylonian uh, in, in terms of its origin. But um, it's, it's usually attributed to Babylon, and that would most likely be at the time of Nebuchadnezzar. Um, this is where we book in, starting with Egypt and now ending with Babylon. It was during Nebuchadnezzar's reign that the exile of the Jews, specifically the southern kingdom of Judah, they were taken into exile over a period of time. It wasn't just one mass deportation, but over a period of time, the, the Jews were taken to Babylon. That's where we would pick up, for example, with Daniel. Um, Belshazzar, mentioned in the Bible, it's either Nebuchadnezzar's son or maybe his grandson, but um, he is mentioned in, in, in the Bible. Uh, Daniel chapter 5, his death is recorded, and it's interesting. So Belshazzar, from the external, non-biblical history, they actually put his death date as October, I believe it's October 7th of 586 B.C. No, sorry, uh, October 7th of um, 539 B.C. How they can get that specific, I don't know. But I find that interesting because that's when you know that the writing on the wall took place. <laughs> it was the same day. But Belshazzar, um, you know, when Daniel interpreted that writing, Belshazzar then, uh, his life was taken that night. Babylon flourished until they were con uh, conquered by the Medes in 539 B.C. Uh, pretty much after Nebuchadnezzar died, it just went downhill quick. Belshazzar's arrogance, which is what he was, his life was required for him because of that arrogance, um, you know, I, I draw a connection there. His arrogance led to an overall decline in, in the overall atmosphere and, and personality of Babylon and, and the, the empire declined quickly, uh, ultimately being overtaken by the Medes in 539. Do you have a... somebody else, that it declined rapidly. Well, I appreciate your comment, and if you couldn't hear, God, uh, Jamin was recognizing God told Nebuchadnezzar, I've given you this, I'll take it away, I gave it to him again, so it's not a surprise to see that God was consistent, and, 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 and one of the um, critic, you know, crit a, a, a critique of Belshazzar is, you're his son, or at least his grandson, you saw what happened. You should have known, and yet your arrogance got you in trouble anyway. I, that's a whole quarter's worth of lessons <laughs> built in there. Um, all right, I'll wrap up. So we have Daniel, which we've touched on. Uh, this, again, would be Nebuchadnezzar chapter 2, where Daniel interprets his dreams. And then um, Daniel chapter 5, we read the story about Belshazzar. 35 minutes. We just covered thousands and thousands of years. Um, I hope that's helpful. Any, any last minute thoughts or questions?
Sorry for the lecture format. I know that's kind of tough. That was a lot of information to get through, but I do hope it's helpful. All of this sets the stage for next week. We'll tie it all together. Uh, I'll have some, some final thoughts. And, and like I say, I want to hear from you. Uh, this has been a quarter study that's a little different than anything I've ever done before, uh, maybe different than what you've endured before. Um, <clears throat> But I will ask you to come prepared next week to, to tie all of this back to the concept of culture. It's real. We live in a culture. We could all have conversations about what that culture is, for better or worse. So did those people then. And that's, that's the point of going, of approaching this entire quarter the way I have. Recognizing that they were real people. Living in real times with real victories, with real defeats, with real families. Real sickness, real marriages, real births, real deaths. We're out of time. Thank you.